Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Maureen and McLean presenting her new poetry collection, More Anon, in conversation with Katie Peterson. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and to our new digital community. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account. Upcoming virtual events include poet Kaveh Akbar, fiction writer Carolyn Farrell, and renowned author Joyce Carol Oates. Please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates and to browse our shelves virtually at your heart's content. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, please click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. This event will have closed captioning available as well. Depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of More Anon on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Cambridge. Thank you so much for showing up and tuning in both in support of our authors and also the truly incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past year and change, technical issues may arise. We of course hope they don't, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Maureen N. McLean is a poet and literary critic whose previous works of poetry include Some Say, Ms. N, The Serial, A Poem in Episodes, and the 2014 National Book Award finalist, This Blue. Her book, My Poets, a hybrid memoir, a hybrid of memoir and criticism, excuse me, was a finalist for the 2012 National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. Katie Peterson is the author of the poetry collections, This One Tree, Permission, The Accounts, A Piece of Good News, and most recently, Life in a Field. She lives in California and teaches at the University of California, Davis. They will be discussing more anon, which gathers a selection of poems from Maureen and McLean's virtually, or excuse me, from Maureen and McLean's critically acclaimed first five books of poetry. As Parul Segal wrote in Book Forum, to read McLean is to be reminded that the brain may be an organ, but the mind is a muscle. Hers is a roving amphibious intelligence. She's at home in the essay and in the fragment, the polemic and the elegy. In more Anon, McLean displays the full range of her vertiginous mind and daring experimentation. I am not a critic, uh, but as a poetry amateur, I will add my good Lord, what Maureen McLean can do with consonants. I'm very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Maureen and Katie. Thanks, Nell. Thanks, Nell. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Harvard Bookstore for having this event. I want to thank Maureen McLean for writing these wonderful poems and thank FSG for publishing such wonderful books of poetry. I'm going to start by saying a few words about Maureen's book and then Maureen's going to read. We're going to talk a little bit and then there's going to be time for your questions. They were not kidding when they said they were blinded by a vision of love. It was not just a matter of speaking or feeling, though it's hard to say how the dead really felt harder even than knowing the living. These first stanzas of this indelible poem, They Were Not Kidding in the 14th Century by Maureen McLean, offer Dante's Paradiso served up in our own language, Pope Francis style mandatory vernacular. But they also offer a deeper argument an insistence that an aesthetic experience, experience of art actually works, that it's not simply a manner, even if or in order to approach it, we need our own idiom. 
it happened. It can happen again. It could happen to you. It happened one night. Look, see, my words just turned into the movies talking about it. They couldn't stay still. In McLean's poems, things are always turning into other things. This insistence that stuff in the 14th century, a century which is actually in this poem, not a historical time period, but a book actually happened, isn't the end of the story. It can't be a hard or elemental truth. It's a thought in the moment that leads immediately to another that undoes it. Though it's hard to say how the dead really felt harder even than knowing the living. And this is where McLean does something astonishing with ease. Astonishing with ease in the poetry circus, we're all performers, but we're not all as good at, as Maureen at this trapeze. She pairs the knowing of the dead with the knowing of the living. She implies here by comparing them slyly, I'd say that knowing the dead and knowing the living have something to do with each other, that those forms of knowing matter to each other, and therefore that knowing the living is hard, meaning difficult, but also not soft, not easy to chew, not something to be done by someone without teeth, something only to be done by someone diabolical of the devil's party and knows it, who says of a squid stew in the poem Genoa, I stick a fork in an animal, fork in a soul, and I eat and eat until kingdom come. You've been served. In other words, the world is divided into two kinds of people, the living and the dead. To get political about it, our fundamental relationship the one that matters is this one, that between the living and the dead and the history of literature served in Maclean's poetry in generous and democratic heaps gives us an opportunity to give that political vision a test drive. Here's why this matters. Discerning the difference between the dead and the living is particularly difficult in a world in which many apparently living people seem dead and some of them even vote. The effort your life requires exhausts me. McLean writes in the poem I quote above, depending on how your day is going, this may apply to few or many, but also many apparently dead things strangely seem to be living. Proust's Albertine, Brutalist sculptures, fragments of Sappho, Costco, mountains, triolets, sonnets, quote, a tiny repertoire of end rhymes enough to win a queen and empire. Not to mention the things and people that some people think are living, other people don't. The poem, Girls in Bed, one of the most wonderful in Moranon, can tell you a little bit about that. Indeed, this book is full of beds with apparently sleeping girls who are doing, doing many other things besides sleeping, and some of them doing those things even with each other. Let's just say one dumb man's dead girl is another woman's living ardor, and the ardor is the proof. I say what McLean says, Sappho says, whatever one loves is. Moranon's particular wisdom might be how it establishes that the most credible living things only live and live on by having a part of and an awareness of their dying. This is precisely what poems have to offer. The poems of the book love refrain for this reason, refrain which telegraphs a desire to continue while acknowledging the scarcity of available language to do so. This is the smell test, not of your fellow men and women, but of your fellow books and artworks and movies. Animals do well in this test. People, hmm, well, not so much. You can only really know and be close to creatures who live with this kind of deathly awareness, even if it stings. Here, from the poem Passage One, bees in clover, summer half over, friends without lovers. Maureen McLean's wonderful selected poems is a wild riot of a book. Like Dr. Frankenstein, the poet raided her own life in poems, assembling a wholly new creature. The new creature lives differently and more strangely than in any of the previous volumes. Were fragments enough for a life? She questions in the first poem collected here. Yes, enough in the most blazing sense, but not more than enough, more anon. Ooh, Katie, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, so happy to be in an ongoing conversation with you and in conversation with you tonight. And um, I'll start with a poem that, that starts this book, Envoy. Go little mind book and blow her head off. Make her wretch and weep and ache in the gut. Make her regret everything about her life that doesn't include me. Um, being able to launch this book at the Harvard Bookstore is especially wonderful. Uh, I had the privilege of reading at the Harvard Bookstore in person um, 
back earlier in the 2000s. And I want to thank Nell Pepper and Alexis Nowicki of FSG for arranging this and shepherding us. Um, and I thought since we are uh, we are assembled and congregated uh, here today um, under the banner of uh, Harvard Bookstore in New England, maybe thinking a little bit New Englandly first might be a thing to do. And these poems are partly sponsored by Amtrak, um, Eastern Corridor, a poem called Regional. And uh, today I'll be reading, um, I mean, I feel like Katie just, just gave us uh, and me this just, uh, unbelievable kind of compressed anthology already of more and on. I'm just so delighted by that. And uh, today I'll, I'll read uh, about 20 minutes of poems drawing from uh, different moments in the book uh, as a kind of anthology of an anthology. So this poem, Regional, verges by the tracks, beyond them the pines as we rattle by haven after haven, west and new, Snaking our way to the first city of the Republic, of which the historian of the American South remarked, if I could live my life in any era, I would choose Boston, circa 1820. Inspiring diverse thoughts among the students, listening or not as they pleased, because pleasure will make its crooked steel-tied way to the heart of the assembled population, even in New England. And another poem um, on route, train travel, locales, uh, quiet car. Um, and it's been a long time since I've been in a train. Um, quiet car. The willows lost its hair. The snows receded almost everywhere and you are riding in the quiet car. The branches mostly bare, but the thin ice sheets that cracked and chimed the pond have vanished into the water while you are riding in the quiet car. Walking around the reservoir, canvas backs gliding on the water, the path two miles, perhaps a bit more, while you are riding in the quiet car. Soon I will climb in the old blue car and drive to Back Bay, not too far from you, my love, now riding in a quiet car. I th um, prompted by Katie's thoughts about the relations of the living and the dead um, and, and how, how this book came to be, um, I found some uh, archival materials uh, and uh, people who just, uh, um, welcome and sponsored me uh, as a younger poet. And if this were a different and better world, we would all be alive and together. And I would like to, to thank um, uh, Bill Corbett, who alas, uh, died a few years ago, who published um, a very early chapbook of mine, uh, his press pressed wafer, and uh, Askold Melnicek and his press, Aerosmith Press, was the, the first press to, to publish a chapbook of mine back in 2005. And both of these presses, Aerosmith and Press Wafer, were kind of Boston and Cambridge outfits and um, acts of incredible generosity, community and solidarity. And these, these people uh, fostered and, 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 and in Oscold's case are continuing to foster and in Bill's case is still continuing to foster so many writers and poets and friendships. Um, so these were, these were the, the chapbooks back from 2005, 2006, this caring life. Um, and so I really wanted to, to salute those presses um, and those people, uh, you know, um, there have been, you know, over time, there have been a lot of losses and, and many of you who are on this webinar may have also experienced uh, losses, whether COVID related or otherwise in the past several years. And I'm very mindful of that too, um, given that this book distills writing and thought and living over the past 15 to 20 some years. Um, so these people are very much on my mind and, and, and with me and um, hopefully with us all <laughs> um, in as much as we can name them. Um, I thought since we are not 
too far uh, away from Bastille Day, it might be uh, always timely to read a letter from Paris. Um, also, since the revolution is not finished, uh, letter from Paris. The French are universal, particularly in their regard for their darker brothers, who under the majesty of the law are prohibited equally with the white and the rich from sleeping under the bridges of Paris. The heavy shining stones of the Third Republic and the iron filigree of a thousand balconies sing, struck by the wind and a broom beating a carpet, and the children shout in the playgrounds, their voices in school so ruthlessly suppressed. The American chain stores have landed, despite patrimony, but foie gras persists untroubled by the protests of Californians. And surrounded by so much self-evident finishing off, it's hard to resist the trimmed leather jacket, the fur coat that floats by as natural as the clouds, and the roast innards of a million beasts gone to a long acculturated death. If I am out of joint, it is because I have gone completely allegorical, and my old dreams of wholeheartedness and a justified life have flown out the window like yesterday's suicide off the Montparnasse Tower. It's best to avoid grotesque similes, but someday these likenings may become precise as the watches the Huguenots perfected before they fled to the Peba and South Africa and elsewhere carrying with them a sober, intricate knowledge of weaving and timepieces and the Hebrew Bible. I'm drawing up an indictment of the French and reason and human rights, which begins by unlinking these concepts and concludes in weeping. Revolution is not only disappointed love on Tan. There was a time when the earth and every common scene featured a green clearing where men and women grew strong in their sweet regarding each other as fellows and their children new sprung in a new world. We have written this story again and again, and that it was written does not make it false, whatever the logic of pastoral and its oblique compensations for the real we never experience its impossible promise of a shepherded life. The thing was that shining. Let us not put a date on what now seems forever to be disappearing. This next is a, um, I'm gonna read from a poem called Songs of a Season Two and um, I remember hearing the poet Paul Muldoon say the foremost terrifying words in the English language were a sequence of poems, but um, I am only, I'm gonna ex extra, excerpt from this. Um, and uh, it's a sequence in a triolet form with a lot of returns and refrains and um, yeah, as you'll hear, songs of a season two. Sun through the thick glass, another morning come. Dreams done, dawn past, sun through the thick glass. A faint light, the days cast. What's done is done and done. Sun through the thick glass, another morning come. To want to be awake every hour, to miss nothing of the changeable air, the lake. To want to be awake in the light and starred dark every instant another thing to want, to be awake every hour, to miss nothing. A tender mist barely there in the morning, a soft sun, dew on the grass, light chill in the air, a tender mist barely there, August near over. What to make clear before the end of the season? Barely there in the morning, a soft sun. The husband I never think of returns one night in a dream. Who were those people? The moon above, the husband I never think of, shines its indifferent love, shines its unwavering beam. The husband I never think of returns one night in a dream. 
Sun in the cedars, the moon in the pines, the day breaks itself clear, sun in the cedars, of the moon in the pines, and everyone sees again how it ends, the sun in the cedars, the moon in the pines. Have I been resting my elbows in bird shit? Are there birds nesting above, flinging direct hits where I have been resting my arms? Was it a blue tit with done it? I have been resting my elbows in bird shit. Was it merely personal, this interest in one's own life? Each morning bought the same bird call. Was it merely personal, the persistent cardinal? He sang in the cedars a red knife. Was it merely personal, this interest in one's own life? The grandparents sink below the horizon like their parents before. Unlinked to the earth, the grandparents sink. What they were, what we are, soon indistinct. The effort of living done, the grandparents sink below the horizon. Morning sun gone, clouds in the hemlock, the wash undone. Morning sun gone, what should I have done? Called the friend, taken a long walk, Morning sun gone, clouds in the hemlock. Good looks will only get you so far, and that far I fully intend to go. So she says, smoking in the car. Good looks will only get you so far. Scanning for lines in the mirror, she considers what Botox won't mend. Good looks will get you only so far, whatever you fully intend. No escape from the endless chatter of people on cell phones talking as if it all mattered. No escape from the chatter, the world to be nattered away in a blizzard of blank tones. No escape from the endless chatter of people, cell phones. Time to admit that misanthropy has a logic to it. Time to admit some days you'd quit the species and flee. Time to admit that misanthropy. What happens in one place will soon happen everywhere, wrote the man with the seamed face. What happens in one place will not be confined to that place, will spread and soon displace what happens. One place will soon become everywhere. Do you still think of me as I still think of you when I'm by the sea? Do you still think of me when you pass that stand of cherry trees, that bar on 81st only we knew? Do you still think of me as I still think of you? Never again to visit that place and never to think of it. Never to see again that face, never to visit that place, never to try to stash the suitcase in an overhead bin, it won't fit. Never again to visit that place and never to think of it. The language bore me along. Before I knew anything, there was its welcoming song. The language bore me along. Strange to have gotten so wrong so much to know nothing but language that bore me along before I knew anything. Who were you to her and who was she to me? At 3 a.m. I wonder, who were you to her and what did you murmur to her when you suddenly saw me? Who you were to her and who she was to me? Those little crushes that sneak up tiny ambushes. These little crushes betrayed by flushes you can't cover up. Those little crushes, they sneak up. Your tongue in my mouth in the afternoon light. Your breath in my breath, your tongue in my mouth, your breast on my breast in the unbreaking heat. Your tongue in my mouth in the afternoon light. Five weathers in one afternoon. A day seemed a year, seemed a life, seemed a cloud become a balloon. Five weathers in one afternoon. However it changes, the moon rings its changes, each riff less brief than the weather this afternoon. A day seemed a year, 
seemed alive. Um, I thought I'd read a poem from um, the book. I'm reading a poem for, from each of the books, a poem from the book, Ms. and the Serial. And that is the, uh, a book that has a, a, a more consistent character, Ms. N, who has various um, adventures, thoughts, mishaps and um, impasses. And uh, in this poem, uh, Ms. N is considering um, the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley in his last great unfinished poem, The Triumph of Life, unfinished because he drowned before he could finish it. Um, he drowned in the Bay of Spezia, very young. Um, Shelley, uh, Democrat, uh, philanthropist, and atheist, as he signed himself into a hotel in Geneva, uh, in Greek. Um, Ms. N, Triumph of Life. Some are a lot easy and slip into the world's skin as their own and plums. Mizen isn't one or wasn't. Then what is life? I cried. Cried Shelley in one version of The Triumph of Life. The title of which from one angle is a satirical title. Triumphs in those days, like Romans, a chance to parade the victims, in this case, the victims of life, which are in the end, from a mortal angle, Everyone, better never to have been, the old sage said, and each world rediscovers no river, no river twice. And yet it seems the same river, however much you are not the same. He's not so bleak, that sleek and laughing vegetarian poet. Oh, could you not learn to swim, you idiot, singing yourself aboard ships you could sail but not sail home? Just like you to learn to sail and not to swim. Just like Mizen to dive in after him. I think um, across the book are a number of poems um, uh, taking up in various ways, uh, fragments we have from, uh, from Sappho. And um, one of the one of the poems in, in my most recent book before this um, was the title poem, Some Say, and it takes wing from uh, fragment 16, which uh, in the you know, Harvard Loeb, D.A. Campbell uh, translates as, some say a host of cavalry, others of infantry, and others of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth, but I say it is whatsoever a person loves. Some say. Some say a host of horsemen, a horizon of ships under sail is most beautiful, and some say a mountain embraced by the clouds, and some say the badass booty shaking shorties in the club are most beautiful, and some say the truth is most beautiful, dutifully singing what beauty might sound under stars of a day. I say what they say is sometimes what I say. Her legs long and bare, shining on the bed, the hair, the small tuft, the brown languor of a long line of sunlit skin. I say, whatever you say I'm saying is beautiful. And wither truth, beauty, and wither, wither in the weather of an old day, sucker punched by a spiral of Arctic air, blown into vast florets of ice, binding the Great Lakes into a single cracked sheet, the airplanes fly unassuming over. Oh, they eat and eat the steel mouths and burn what the earth spun eons to form. Some say calamity and some catastrophe is beautiful. Some say porn, some jolly led. Some say beauty is hanging there at a dank bar with pretty and sublime, those sad bitches left behind by the horsemen. Um, and I'll, I'll end with two poems. Uh, one, um, how about uh, again, it's against the promise of a view. Um, one second, which is 
uh, toward the end of this book, Against the Promise of a View. A difficult climb to a beautiful view. I don't like it. I don't like the way you make me go positively Protestant. All this deferral up to a future only you've seen, the ascent always leveraged against an alien payoff already prescriptive. When we get there, I'll be dead tired, too tired to view the view the way I want it. I wanted the way to be beautiful as a stroll in the hanging gardens of Babylon, or the wisteria-laden lanes of the Rose Garden and the Bois de Boulogne, as beautiful as a jam Sixth Avenue crosswalk in Midtown. I wanted to be going nowhere, nowhere we know, not to have to breathe so hard into a future someone else promised. I know reputable studies show the capacity to delay gratification makes for a happy person and nation, but oh, I just want and want now a perpetual, beautiful stroll nowhere. I don't want to look back and say, ah, that was so worth it. Because even if it was, it wasn't. I don't want to keep my head down for miles, alert for insurgent roots, a falling branch, my legs punctured by stinging flies that harry the way, only to be able to say at some notional top, however beautiful, how beautiful, and see no insects here, and why not lunch? Somehow, it was just the glorious sun and 12 islands inlaid in a lake and the distant silent powerboats. Somehow it was a vision of all as dust. If I go on pilgrimage, I want every age to be a stage one can look around and say, how interesting. And yes, a cup of coffee would be nice. I'm not going anywhere fast, but where we're all going. And I'll end with the envoy sending this book out. Envoy Eclipse. I don't trust myself not to look. So Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. I feel like there's implied applause here. Um, I'm so glad that you read that last poem and the lines I'm thinking of are, I want it to be going nowhere, nowhere. We know not to have to breathe so hard into a future somewhere, someone else promised. And earlier in the poem, letter from Paris, thinking about the lines, I am drawing up an indictment of the French in reason and human rights, which begins by unlinking these concepts and concludes in weeping. And those two pieces are two of my favorite pieces of language here. And I think one of the reasons why I like them both so much is because they not only register a desire for, but they do, they do almost with like two hands in the voice, a form of, of like aggressively unproductive thinking, right? They undo as opposed to do. And I wanted to ask you about that, about, and in that second poem, it's the, it, I'm also thinking about the poem called Mesh, where you say, why should I feel bad about beauty, which is a poem about putting things together. I wanted to ask you about the relationship between poetry and undoing, destroying, wrecking, um, refuting is another thing you often do with great glee um, in the poems and why you think you like that and what you think it does. Oh my goodness. Um, now I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, of what is it? Um, you know, massively unproductive thinking as a good title for a book. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. And I, I, I don't know that I have um, a ready answer, but I certainly have ready affinities. I respond to that quality in, in poets like Shelley, who's full of this, um, uh, brilliant complex negations, you know, unmaking the world and unmaking the premises of the world that is a botched world, that is a glitched world, that is an, you know, um, an ungiving and unsustaining uh, world. And so there's something about um, uh, the refutation of the actual <laughs> uh, as, an or as an incredibly important, um, uh, you know, cognitive and for some people spiritual and political gesture and also there's something too about 
the mind in motion, you know, and, and that I, I always uh, was attracted to poets and poems um, who offered that to us, you know, some, some, something by John Donne or something, poems that actually um, didn't shy away from argument, but not argument necessarily in the sense of proof. And also thinking hard too about unmaking and undoing and redoing is its own kind of shadow making, carving out the negative space of what might be possible. And, um, and what might be audible for us. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in the contingency uh, of knowledge and the contingency of, of our um, uh, care and, and affiliations and, and the way poems carry and hold that and test that. Um, so I don't know if that is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole theological, you know, it's something about apophatic, you know, um, theology and, you know, but, but uh, yeah, those are some of the things that come to mind. I'm interested in that too, because I feel like I'm interested in um, forms of authority that don't look like authority, right. And forms mm -hmm. of judgment that don't necessarily look like judgment. And mm -hmm. that's something that has always appealed to me and your poems, as you know, I love an argument as well. Um, and would, you know, ha have rarely seen a fight I don't want to be in, but I don't always want to be seen as a fighter in the, in, in the traditional way. And I was, I was thinking about judgment um, in your poems, aesthetic judgment, you know, judgment of artworks, judgment of lovers, you know, judgment of the past, judgment of your own past, the unpredictability of me memory, the way that memory is changed. And so you can wake up in them and they feel quite different. Um, and I wanted to ask you something about judgment and poetry. I wanted to ask you whether or not you think poems can be wrong about things and can they be right about things? And does, does, that, does it matter in a poem whether you're right or wrong about something or is a poem about some other way of being in terms of judgment other than rightness and wrongness? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful, um, challenging set of questions. Um, I mean, there's so many different, you know, doors one could open here and, 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 you know, uh, for example, um, I think pound is wrong in the later cantos. <laughs> Actually, I think they bespeak, you know, heinous, um, you know, grotesque judgment. Uh, other other modes of uh, judgment that are less um, violent and volatile. Uh, do I think Ted Hughes should have published the birthday letters? No. Do I think Robert Lowell should have? Uh, uh, handled the way he did Elizabeth Hardwick's letters? No. I mean, these are different orders of question, but I am interested, I mean, when you were talking about judgment and this, this sense of also the contingency and the re, re, revisiting and revising our judgments, um, I also was thinking of the term consideration, which is maybe, maybe a much, much wafflier term, but, um, uh, but I do like the idea of poems as spaces both for consideration and reconsideration. And also I'm interested in, in uh, uh, poems as retractions, you know, palinodes. It's like, well, um, that was then, this is now, or the ratios of thought and feeling that might have, you know, um, propelled certain things at a certain moment no longer hold. How does one hold that sense of one's own um, internal self difference over time, you know. Um, I guess I, I remember just more, you know, colloquially. I can't. I don't know if it was a student or a friend or something I overheard on the radio. You know, this sort of anxiety about being judgy, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm like, embrace it, you know. If but but also in the sense of, well, what's what's uh, I'm interested in what's moving behind and through judgment, and and so. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in, you know, and you know this in in song, right? And so this this question of song thought uh, and 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 how that uh, or rhythmic thought and how that can work. And I guess just to put a little period on this ramble, I do I do think when I think of you know judgment and judging, I think of this line from Gertrude Stein: "I judge, judge."
Something that I um, I really love about reading this book all the way through and being with it is it helped me articulate something that I really admire about your work, which is, you know, I, I think a lot of us who are readers are struggling at this moment with looking back at what we used to call the canon, but I don't know anyone who calls it that anymore, what we sometimes used to call the tradition, but I don't know what anybody who calls it that anymore, at least in front of a room of undergraduates. Um, and what some of us just call reading and in your hands, sometimes I just feel like you're talking about reading. You you have this amazing way of, um, when I think about that poem, they, they were not kidding in the 14th century, I think, what would it be like to somehow find a way to democratize this thing that is utterly undemocratic, the idea of a literary tradition, to be able to kind of go into it and take the pieces of it that matter and call out parts of it as mistakes. Another way of saying this is that like, Dante may have been wrong about a bunch of stuff, but a bunch of people were also super wrong about Dante. And so when you go back and you look at Dante and if you just see the image blinded by love, you kind of get something out of that, right? There's something simply about crediting the experience of at the base of that, which is really the thing that Dante is trying to preserve in some way. And this, some people might think this is impossible, but for me as a reader, like I feel like all I've wanted half my life is to like look at the what, like what we call the Western tradition and not cleanse it of all those nasty feelings and bad imperialisms, but see it as continuous with life in some way. Sorry to ramble back at you. I wanna ask you one unhard question. I think it's an unhard question and then move to some of these wonderful questions that are coming in in the Q and A. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question about the book because I think it is kind of revelatory to read your work this way, poem by poem. And a, a poet once said to me that writing a great line is harder than writing a great poem and writing a great poem is harder than writing a great book. When you made a selected, you must have had to return to the experience of the single line and the experience of the individual poem in order to make this new whole. How did you know that you wanted to include a poem in More and On? And are there some poems, you don't have to tell us which ones from the other books that you didn't include because you looked at them and you said, I don't want this in another book. Like, what was that experience like? Oh, it's a, a great question. Um... And I think I think I you know this sense of you know rereading oneself toward an end you know it's not like I sit around and reread myself <laughs> um, so so it's so it's interesting you know again you know going back with with judgment um, uh, in the foreground right with a with a very different kind of eye um, often years after one had drafted these poems um, I think you know my principle my I think the my operating principle implicitly was to be thinking about the, not line by line, but about the gestalt of poems. And also one thing that, that has mattered a lot for me in putting together books is uh, resonance, difference, variation, and um, both how things might stand alone as, as discrete poems, but also how you are uh, potentially on an itinerary. And so, the, you know, there was a pretty heavy winnowing here. Um, you know, half to a third of each book is not in, in here. And I think it just throws other things into relief. And I felt like it um, allowed me uh, to foreground, say, certain kinds of se series that happened across books, uh, like these returns to sapphic fragments um, or uh, and, and sometimes too, um, if if I felt a certain poem was was holding a certain chord in the book, I felt like I didn't need to resound that chord with another kindred poem later in the book. So, so sometimes if you if you do look at this, if you do look at the book, you'll see some poems have numbers like Passage One or Songs of the Season Two, and uh, you aren't going to find Passage Two or in Songs of the Season Three, which exist in other books. Um, but I think it, it partly um gestures toward um what the 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 background reverberations that went into into the other books but i hope that this is a very uh concentrated and yet aerated um uh, experience for somebody if they wanted to you know read it through um or if they just wanted to dip in um 
So, I mean, I, I find it in, uh, that, it, that, that calibration you began with the person who said it, it's harder to write a, a good line. I don't know. I don't think I agree with that. <laughs> Although I am thinking of some amazing single line poems, you know, like um, Merwin, W.S. Merwin's Elegy, Who Would I Show It To? You can just sit with that for, you know, a long time. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I was very interested in, in uh, because uh, over the, the course of, of these books, I've had some, you know, pretty long poems with really elaborate architectures, and I've had some very short, pithy, uh, um, sometimes inflected by haiku poems, and I wanted there to be um, some of that here in the mix, too. I don't know about the single line part of that. I think that there's a there's a particular glory in writing a poem that works that to me is more glorious than writing a book that's beautiful. And I think that must be true for many of us who write poetry because we didn't originally write books. We just wrote poems and half the time we didn't even know what lines were. Um, <laughs> something that seems really like that comes to the surface in your selection are some of these daily rituals like um, being, being in the cafe, swimming, um, being in bed, wait, waiting for someone to wake up. And those rituals seem to be able to hold your capacious mind really elegantly in the book. Um, and because of that, the, the, my overwhelming sensation when I finished it, right, was that this was a person, and again, this was true for the length of the book, so don't get a big head about it, right? But like, this is a person with a functioning inner life and, a fu and, and in the book, there is a functioning public sphere. It's not the same as ours, right? It's not, it's all the facts aren't the same. Your public sphere is mainly friends and friendship relationships and the world of literature. But in putting that together, you really just put a whole world together. And so there's something about the selection of the poems, I think that does that really elegantly and really well. Um, there are some questions in the chat from audience members and I thought it'd be a great time to move to them. I wanna make sure these voices get heard. Um, and one of them says the following, it's from Joshua Hauser. As a writer, how do you think of your reader or readers as you write? Do you think of specific people, groups, other? Does thinking about different readers affect how you write? Uh... The short answer is it depends. Um, normally, I'm not thinking about um, I'm not thinking about a reader other than myself implicitly as the reader writer unit. Although I do write poems for people and about people, and um, so that's a different kind of wager, I would say. But um, I always I always felt like um, one one at least for me. I'm carrying an inner possibility of, 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 of audition and reception as opposed to um, saying, I mean, I might, I might say after I've assembled a lot of things, then I will be thinking, uh, might I give this to uh, my partner, Laura, <laughs> to, to, to look at it, but it's not, that's a different thing from saying, um, I am thinking of X reader with every line or in every, um, that said, I have been in recent years, I asked friends to commission me to write a poem for them. Um, I wanted to be occasioned by, by friendship. And in that case, um, I am thinking about the terms of their commission. And that's, that's been a really lovely and different kind of relation. So I'm sorry, that's a little bit um, of a forking answer, but. I think that totally comes across in the poems that there's this um, in, kind of implicit, almost equalizing relationship of elective affinity of mm -hmm. friendship. And you used the word possibility earlier in your answer. Um, and I, I was thinking about how different it is to think about friendship as, as a relationship that has tons of possibilities in it than to think about a person you're already totally intimate with or to think about a stranger. There's something about the variegated intimacy and friendship and it's fluctuations that matches the rhythm of your lines as well. Um, there's a wonderful, beautiful question here from a person who, um, like the title of your book, wishes to remain anon. Thank you for reading 
Maureen, your poems embrace language from all walks of life, studies you have read, images from Sappho, slang, irony. Do you find the work of making poetry as a synthesis of all the language you encounter and absorb? That's a great question. I guess I would say it it, it really kind of, those ratios vary. Um, I mean, some, some, some poems seem to kind of tune into a, a narrower bandwidth of language and other poems are really omnivorous and uh, really want to be pivoting from, you know, across registers and um, uh, slang, so-called obscenity to, you know, uh, recondite theoretical terms. And I, I it depends on what, uh, again, what, what kind of key I'm writing in, but I am interested in, I'm, I'm, interest, I'm interested in this as a reader. I'm interested in some work that is, um, say, quite austere in its, and, and, and focused in its linguistic register. And I'm also really, really interested in um, uh, people who are um, omnivores, polyglot, and doing all kinds of things to and with Englishes and other languages they are lassoing into their poems. So I wouldn't say, I, I certainly, up to this point, who knows what might happen tomorrow, but I'm not the person who says, and now I shall write a poem of mixed dic diction, or, and now I shall write a poem in a, um, what, uh, a fluent vernacular, <laughs> you know, so, but, but there is, there is, it's almost like musical keys or modes or, you know, what, you know, uh, what is the raga for the morning, you know, it, 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 it creates a kind of mode in which one works. And one more question here. Um, Celeste Langan, I love the way some of the poems you read connect the poem with the refrain, good looks will only get you so far. And your poem rejecting the pilgrimage for a look that was so worth it. When you selected the poems from more on, did you think about those connections? And I think this is a great question pairs with the earlier one because it's about, in a way, you know, about selecting for aboutness and for theme and, I, something that we haven't talked about, but it's what would be worth talking about seems to piggyback on this question is the relationship between your poems and the buildings Roman in the 19th century. Um, those themes seem to come about in the selected too by virtue of the subjects recurring. That's a great question. And, and, and thank you, Celeste. And thank you, Josh. And thank you, Anonymous. Um, very much in the spirit of more Um And I, you know, uh, it's unsurprising that, that, you know, Celeste would zoom in and make brilliant connections. And I was not consciously aware of that particular connection. But, um, but, but I think there are a lot of subliminal recurrences uh, that, that I must have been keying into in, in assembling things. It's also, you know, one one has one has preoccupations, right? And I, I think it's I, I don't know. I think it was Yeats who said, you know, the permanent, you know, subjects of permanent poetic interest, you know, sex and death. And um, I, th they seem to be definitely, you know, in the top five. <laughs> and and um, and I, I love. Uh, I mean, Katie, I know you had said there were, you know, in reading it, you, certain new things leap out, like. You saw there are a lot of beds, you know, in this book. There are a lot of birds. There are a lot of. Um, uh, I remember uh, I, another friend said, you know, there there's a lot of wine and beer in this book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you know, and in some ways these are things, um, you know, materializations of appetites, right, and or of, of, of daily rituals and our textures of of uh, being a you know a physical creature in a physical world. But I also think this question of, you know, the look, the sound, the, um, uh, the thought, uh, these also recur a lot too. So, um, so I wish I could claim more intentionality there, but, but uh, I think intention was working on, 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 on other axes, so. I'm interested in the idea that for any interesting poet, and you are more than interesting poet, you're a wonderful poet, there's almost like a shadow novel going on behind all the poems with scenes yeah. that recur, like the novel that you could have written and the poems are almost lifted from that. Um, and it's to see the Miss N poems in light of the other poems, you see how much in those um, is lyric and recurs, like narrative scenes that kind of come back 
And the, I guess the reason why I think that's interesting is because there's something deeply at work in these poems about relationality and about sympathy, about how far you can go with somebody, how far you go with Shelley, how far Shelley will go with you, things like that. Um, it seems as if Hillary Shute has gotten here under the wire with a great question, so I'm going to ask it. Maureen, what are some of the ways you would characterize any shifts in your concerns and or sense of the poetic voice from the earlier poems to the later poems? Oh my goodness, Hillary. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, in some ways, you know, Katie's helped like prepare the answer for me. I think one of the things that happened was um, uh, a kind of desire and, and, and uh, to work in um, song and fragment modes, which really predominated in, in, in some earlier books and then building larger structures. Uh, I got increasingly interested in the mid to late 2010s in writing in a more narrative key. And that, that, isn't, that was not a thing I was particularly oriented to. I mean, I, was, I did have uh, an interest in um, how uh, poems could hold essayistic momentum. Like in, I have a, there's a poem, uh, Excursion Susan Sontag here, and this sense of an excursion or a divigation that might really um, go through a lot of um, thoughts and considerations. That was, I think, about um, as far as I went. And I, I had an early poem, I think I first drafted it in 2005 from Ms. and the Serial, and I thought that was uh, a one-off. And it was put together out of scenes as a po uh, uh, and, and bits and kind of shards that hopefully assembled. And then, you know, some 10 years later, uh, that seemed newly uh, interesting and vital as a, as a place to develop um, work. And, and so I think that partly I get um, surprised into new possibilities. I think I get, I, you know, reading other people also, um, you know, not wanting, I mean, it's not like I say, and now I refuse to repeat myself. I think that's just a native thing. One doesn't, you know, if, if, if the thing doesn't have to be written, it doesn't have to be written. What feels, what feels compelling to you? And so, um, this is this is more of a retrospective answer from say Mizen forward, and I was I kind of co-composed um, the Mizen the serial book and some say and it was almost like uh, a kind of lyric impulse disaggregated from a narrative episodic impulse, so um, that was just interesting in terms of um, uh, sustaining multiple writing writing projects and the way they kind of. Um, wove distinct blankets. <laughs> and so, um, but, well, you know, we shall see where, 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 where things go. <laughs> um, yeah. So it looks as if we unfortunately have to bring this um, to a close. Thank you so much for this reading and for the wonderful answers and conversation. Thank you so much, Katie, for your just, you know, um, kind of shocking attentiveness and, and you know, brilliance and brilliant engagement. And I also uh, want to again um, uh, to salute Katie's also new book. So if you are uh, looking to buy a book from the Harvard Bookstore, Life in a Field, a beautiful um, fable parable featuring donkeys, a donkey, a girl, a field and life. It's wonderful. Thank you both so much for this just sparkling conversation. This was, I just had this dumb grin on my face for an hour. So thank you so much for this. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us. I reposted in the chat, the uh, harvard.com link to Moranon. And yes, while you're there also, take a check out Katie Peterson's book. And um, I also posted in the chat a link that uh, Maureen sent to me to, for a playlist from uh, David Gutowski's blog called Large, is it Large Hearted Boy? Yes, Large Hearted Boy, a uh, playlist that accompanies the book. Uh, you wanna read some poetry and then listen to some Heinrich Schuss or, or Blind Willie Johnson or Bjork, 
uh, have at it. And um, thank you both so much. Really, really appreciate this. And uh, have have a lovely evening, everyone. Keep reading and stay safe. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nell. Thank Thanks. you all for coming and making this an actual occasion. Thank you.